so I started my life as a violinist. That was my first profession. And uh, it's, not, it's not a good one, because you work too hard for what you get. But uh, I, I learned good things from it, like uh, love for music and discipline, and some kind of uh, physical stamina that came in very handy to when I had to hold a portable camera for a long period of time, because you hold it basically for half an hour when you're dealing with tape, because tape runs on a half hour reels. But um, uh, I, now I play the violin uh, less and less, but I integrated into my video uh, in a way I did not before. I see three mouths. Now you see four, and they are all mine. <laughs> uh, I was, uh, that was this wonderful experience when I had a, a close focusing lens and I could uh, really get very close. But it also expresses my love for the Beatles. Are you satisfied? Oh, okay. You want it again? No. So we skip this? No, go on. Say something about the instrument and the violin, because now you're using it differently, so to speak. I mean, yeah. you are, you're just about to use it differently. Now, you see, uh, this is a musical instrument. And now I work with instruments that are more like maybe visual instruments in the sense that I work with, with image devices instead of sound devices. But they are not altogether different. They are the same. You can integrate them. Like you can make sound for images and images from sound in many different ways. And in this case, I was interested in uh, using the violin to control my image. And I did it by feeding the violin sound into a into a video switcher that would decide which camera would be in or maybe a part of the camera.
Yeah, this is again Iceland. Well, there's plenty of water there. I see fishermen. <laughs> Shut up, you. <laughs> yeah, Iceland is full of water because we have glaciers. And this is like late summer when the sun gets quite hot in the afternoon. And this is taped in the afternoon. It's interesting, late night, the, uh, the same river becomes very low, very quiet when it cools, has cooled off. But uh, it's, full of, it's full, of, full of salmon. There are actually fishermen there that you see from time to time. What's the name of the river? Salmon River. But there are like 20 rivers in Iceland by the name of Salmon River. Laxau. Is a Volkswagen there? Mm. Now, um, now, I was saying something about um, staring at it. Thank you. 
Now, I like this one very much because this is only grain. This whole image is made up of, uh, of television snow. And uh, I feed snow like into the background. But then here in the foreground, I have this uh, scan converter that uh, uh, displays the image on, on television lines. So uh, the result is like there would be a landscape and maybe an ocean or grass or something very organic, something very nature-like. But it has nothing to do with nature because this, is, this images are arrived at without a lens. And then I took the same image uh, and uh, instead of having uh, it uh, split like uh, lower half of it showing this like of landscape, this kind of grass, I, I took the, the whole picture, made it smaller and put it in the middle so that there is uh, an image inside the image. That's a sample of that. And uh, what's interesting is that the uh, background image here is the same as the foreground, except that the foreground image has been put uh, on, the, on the side. So they are, they are running in the same time. But it looks like a sculpture. Yeah, it looks like a sculpture because what happens is that the, the image in the background becomes like, a, it stays two-dimensional, but the foreground image gives you a feeling of, uh, of uh, three-dimensional space.
Yeah, this is similar to the uh, flip-flopping of the landscape, except here is, I am in my studio. This is actually one of the first flip-flops that I did. And um, uh, what I was more interested in this case than in having myself on camera, I was setting up like one of those close loops or close circles that uh, I like to do where where one camera is keeping track of what the other camera is keeping track of. My, like they are watching each other as well as the whole environment. So if you look um, at this picture carefully, you can see both cameras in there, always on the alternate camera that shows it. So they are 180 degrees apart. And I walked into this space uh, once I had set it up and it was flickering. I walked into it and uh, I got very fascinated uh, by trying to uh, see, I'm looking at monitors, I'm, I'm seeing what I'm doing here. And uh, it's very interesting to see yourself front and back while you're moving. It is, it is hard to, uh, to even move in this kind of a space because the feedback of where you are, uh, by, uh, you're, you're moving kinetically, but watching uh, on a monitor what you're doing and you get very, very disoriented. So. Uh, the tape recorder was running, but I never really meant this to, uh, to be any kind of a piece that I would show. I was just, again, I was very curious. I like to keep the tape recorder running because while I'm doing it, I cannot really see totally what I'm doing. I have to then play it back and sit back and look at it. Yeah, I have to be, uh, no, I mean, I wasn't originally supposed to be a part of it. I only wanted the scene. I only wanted the systems to observe one another. I mean, and your presence there is the servicing those machines, or serving them. No, it is op observing myself. Oh, but, but you seem to be quite busy in those pictures. I get very busy, but not as busy as you think, because here where I'm working, uh, one way and I'm working the other way, it is just because it is seen first in one camera and then in the other. So the busyness is basically because of the busyness of the system that I have set up. And I do very little. I just move around just a little bit. I see. So it was a performance. It became a performance. That was originally performance for myself to see uh, back what I had been doing. And then I eventually to de uh, decided to disclose this to the world. I see. So, but then you are observed by those, uh, those machines. Yeah. And you wanted to see how you look. How in, I look when they in, observe me. That's right. Right. And like in this case, it's important that this camera is here. So the camera is here, but then through the camera, you, you see the other image, uh, what the camera is seeing, because it's not usual to show a camera panning this way from, from floor to walls to ceiling. And then, of course, the other ceiling upside down. So what do you mean, it's not usual? Well, it is something that, uh, that you can do easily when you mount your camera onto a mechanical device, like a turntable. But it is, uh, I would like to mount myself on a turntable and see the world this way, but it's much more difficult. <laughs> I see. Yeah, this is interesting because uh, you see the room that this camera is seeing, but you also see the lens. And the image in the lens does not rotate, of course. It stays stationary. So uh, while the camera moves, uh, shows the room, 
turning 360 degrees. The lens never turns the image. Um, but then uh, this is a process called keying. And when you key out, like here, now you see the other camera. You see the tripod here that, uh, with the other camera on it that's looking at this camera. So those cameras are engaged in a duel. They are looking at each other. I see. There are two cameras looking at each other. Yeah. And one of them is rotating, and the other is Stationary. looking at that camera, which is rotating. Which is rotating, exactly. And now you see the windows in here uh, of the room. And that I do just by opening and closing the shutter of the lens. Uh, that way you, you, put, uh, you allow more or less light in, and that changes uh, how much of uh, the picture you, you uh, reveal. Is that clear? Somehow. Now what I, I'm doing here, I'm zooming it in. I zoom first the last image, and then every image after it. And there are like already like eight layers in here that get zoomed out, one after the other. It's also interesting to see in here the degradation of image, how every generation gets more and more washed out. And of course, the, this crispest picture is the uh, one that is closest. That's the last one that was made. That's it. We start up the system, and right now, if you look at the screen, over here, we can show bar bar, and it might work. OK. And it should be demonstrating the XY. And the XY is not working. Oh. Well, we'll try that again for good luck and health. 73000G. We bootstrap the system again. So you notice the DX bootstrapping the disks, getting the system, pulling it up by its bootstraps, and letting you run the operating system called RT11, as indicated in this little left corner, RT11. Now we're going to run something called run DK1 bar bar. This is a program made by Walter Wright, placed together by Walter Wright, demonstrating our XY data selector and also our XY signals that are the heart of our... The guts. Donbass, the guts. And it should be working right on your little monitor and... 
There it goes, right on the monitor, as you see first time, every time. It does wonderful. And we're looking here, and it's very possible it's running, just something is not running. We'll look at it again, seeing what the... <laughs> it's called a loop, yeah. Now you got into loop, <laughs> So we're going to go through this again, just to demonstrate this program endlessly. Number 63757, this is the key number. Now all of you who are sitting in your seats should now, or standing in your seats, should remember 63757. I'll repeat that again. Don't tell anybody. Okay, Mary Hill 7. We'll start that again. 171044. We're going to place in the number 63757. Seven. Got that? Okay, good. It's an important number. Mm. And now we have our test pattern on the screen that um, says that things are working properly. You can see in the back monitor there we have some kind of pattern of sorts. So unleash to be. it, man. Unleash now we're going to start up this whole deal and see what we can get. And we should have something called Bar Bar by Walter Wright. Okay, there it goes. And now mm. what it's indicating in the background, that red bar, is something we call our Ys. That was something called Y2. This is Y3. Next will come Y4. And what these numbers are, are their binary divisions of the raster. Uh, y is, XY is what we call them. It's um, from Cartesian coordinates. X is on the horizontal. Y is on the vertical. And what it does is divides the raster up into um, x and y's. And we could have various divisions. Finer divisions are the higher x's. Now this is the first x that you can see. This is x2, x3. There's red x3 bars. Is not yet. It's no, this is x4. Wow. This is x4. Oh, x4. There's, a ma there's, a mi there's one missing there, which we don't okay. show. It goes 4, 8, and 16. It doesn't and go 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, what it's doing, it's dividing by 2, then it divides by 4, then it divides by 8, then it divides by 16, then it divides by 32, then it divides by 64, then it divides by 128, then it divides by 256, then it divides by 512. And that's our division of the screen. This is strange. Oh, that's why. My mistake. Okay, we can only shift the X, let's say. Oh, we can even shift, now it's shifting diagonally down. We can shift it diagonally up, I guess, would be the next step. Um, we could also shift it only one direction here, so. Yeah, shift it horizontally. Okay, we're now going to shift it horizontally. Let's move it a little bit further. Out there. And now no, we're going to Leave the edge. Leave the oh, edge. Oh, you want the edge? Yeah. Okay, I'll give you the edge. Every, every defect. Like the edge? More. More? Yeah, every defect helps. Good. Okay, great. I love defects, too. Right. By adding numbers, we're shifting it. Yeah, okay, you see, that's see, it's the, kind the of function of shifting is more interesting as a as a concept because you see some people mo think that movement is a movement but they don't understand that the adding that of a number is in fact can represent a movement, movement. yeah that's it looks it. like you you know you push a little bit further stop no no it can't be we must have better that's not right either come on hmm. that's not going down any better. It's Indeed. flickering. Come on. Indeed. You must be able to do better than that. So what can we give it? What, how, do, you, what do you think it needs? How could you get a flicker, by the way? Oh, that's why. It's this. No. This is very bizarre. It's not supposed to do this. Stop. Stop doing that. Stop. Stop. Hmm. He's pondering. He wonders, why is this? Many things we can do. For instance, we can give you this number. First of all, we can divide by two. Go ahead, divide by two. Fool me, divide by two. We can divide by two, doubling the screen in both directions, resulting in four of the same. We can, can get back to where we were, multiply by two. And we can also use the shift as a correction factor. If you notice the screen is slightly off, we can correct for this slight offness, get it back to our standard screen again. We can go so one okay, second. Okay, so what you are doing, uh, you are scaling, in fact. This is called, this would be yeah. a scale factor. Scale that factor, yeah. And if we scale it down very small, we actually duplicate sections of the screen. Yeah, so, and so now by combination of scaling and centering the, 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 the screen by shifting, you can, in fact, induce a, a, a zoom. A zoom. Now, do we have any demonstrations of the zoom? No, we no, don't. No, but we'll just uh, go through showing this, um, this increase. Yeah. This zooming. Taking the left corner of the screen and just 
making it very much larger. A uh, question is this, could you, you can only operate overall sections, you cannot just freeze half of the frame and operate no. just the other half. I right? only can talk about the reference here, no, that right. I have a reference, I can expand the reference, mm -hmm. the X, X I can expand right, this way right, by scaling, mm -hmm. I can shift it, mm -hmm. I can do the same with the Y, I can scale it, right. or I can shift it, which is adding an offset right, right. to it, I can do that. How did you find out that you would like to make arithmetic logic units? Well, it was a thought. Image. The the way the way the way it evolved was yeah, uh, what happened? A true life story. Yeah, right. What happened? A guy came up to me and said, "Listen, yes. I can give you I can give you addition of these patterns." Right. I said, "Well, I don't know. I'm kind of sick of seeing addition." And then, so what happens if we add them together? Mm -hmm. Well, it gives you that. What happens if we arm together? I don't know. We'll get this. Mm -hmm. What happens if we do this? It ends up saying that would take a lot of parts. So why not just use an arithmetic logic unit? And they're available. And people who work in so digital, that. I said that. You don't so believe you it? Are the guy. I'm one of them. I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I was sitting around about. I don't know. It had, was the, the original design was Don MacArthur's, but it's building on a system that's already there. And the point that you can build on a system is so valuable. Mm -hmm. um, that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but what happened was it was a thought on trying to combine these X, Y's and on, on, on adding, subtracting and logical operations. And what happened is the arithmetic logic unit indirectly had these extra things that just were there, stuck in, mm. and by, just by their construction. So in a way, we have um, the designers of these ICs, the digital circuits, happen to give you extra things that, to most people, are completely worthless. They say it's garbage, garbage. But um, graphically, it does have a value. And it, it turns out that when you mix arithmetic and you logical, Boolean logical functions, the patterns become more interesting than just logical and arithmetic alone. Mm -hmm. And so a possible direction to go in is having a faster control over the image on a, on a signal level and expanding this arithmetic and logical combination. And it, it gives pretty pictures, I guess. I don't know. It's colorful. It's pretty, pretty, it's pretty. It's all right, you know. Um, yeah, but you tell me, all the, the, the function that that the arithmetic logic unit has, does it represent a summary of the Boolean algebra? Yeah, it does all the Boolean functions, and yeah. it does, it does so almost all the types. The arithmetic unit is a standard um, type yeah. of unit used in all computers to form the Boolean right. and arithmetic part, an arithmetic mm. logic unit. And they usually sit in every computer around. Yeah. So in a way, we're seeing um, a, um, a, a changing of the standard uh, computer format that we have mm. this arithmetic logic unit and we have this control this control mm. unit and this controller that controls the arithmetic unit. Now we're splitting it into a visual function where now the signals going are not numbers that we manipulate, they're changing numbers that are referenced to the screen. So they're actually forming a visual pattern, which is different. It's different mm. from saying that we just have, we're trying to calculate pi to the nearest mm. decimal point. Now we're trying to generate, we have inputs that are referenced to the screen and we have um, and we have these functions that... So, in represent. a way, this so is what's called a heart. Uh, this is the unit, uh, the, the guts, the, uh, which, in a way, the, uh, computer stands on. What's the minimum that you could present and the input of the arithmetic logic unit? Well, you could present one single bit, That's a right. single on-off on each side, and do logical operations with one bit, which I think may be, may be interesting, so perhaps we should do that? I don't think so, because no. it will be only on and off. There would not well, be a so-called pattern present. It would give a small pattern of four. I see, then it would be interesting. And this is or plus one. As you notice, the slight change there. 
That's the or. That's the or plus one. And it adds in all those extra squares. You yeah, from where? From from the midair? No, it's actually adding to the what it's doing right now. It is doing first a logic function in the background. Then it's adding one to each square. I see. And it's saying whatever a square is very close to the brightest, we'll add one more to it. So that actually adds one. And those squares happen to be pretty bright. They can become brighter. It's mixing an arithmetic mode with a logical mode. And it doesn't have to be a, a coincidence. It doesn't have to make sense either. Yeah, it doesn't. But what you're saying is a, is a very exact score. It's no, it is precise. It's, there is no. It's, indeed, there is no uh, accidentality involved. If you sat down, looking at both those inputs, comparing them as numbers, forming a logic operation A or mm. B, and you added one to that four-bit number, you would get this pattern. On you can mark it down with your hand mm. on a piece of paper. Maybe we should okay. do that one day. But well, the thing is that yeah. the complexity of writing down all those squares is um, it's 16 by 16. A lot of squares to figure out. Yeah, but if someone has the reason to do it, then it's perfectly possible, of course, to work with it as as a, as a scoreable and a, a, a usable material for that particular reason, whatever that reason would be. Okay. okay. There are as an eight by eight squares here, which I'll try and turn the squares on to different colors here. So let me try that right now. I'm going to turn the le far left hand side of the screen, top left hand side of the screen. I'll turn it, um, I don't know, white over there. And you notice you, that's a square, one of the squares. You turn it black. I'll turn the ne one next to it black. Um, And I'm beginning to show the square structure of it, that there are really eight by eight squares. I can go down to the bottom of the screen, far right-hand corner. Yeah, what you are indicating that, in fact, if you have any amount of squares divided on the screen, you could operate from hand one by one. So you eventually can create as complex image as the division of the screen allows you. I'll turn this one to, um, I think, magenta, the bottom right-hand side of the screen there. I can turn it back to red again, if you like. And you could arbitrarily make, well, with limits, you could make the screen divide into many squares. And that's the idea of a frame buffer, that you, you take the screen and make many, many squares, dividing it into um, different elements. But questions arise on how you would change all these elements in real time. And that's really not, not answerable yet. Uh, there are ways. And it usually ends up that you build hardware that does it. In this case, we are changing all of the 64 elements by a program. And this is all in the program control, changing the, s the 64 elements of this memory. There are other programs around to do that, like Explore by Ken Knowlton. But this is meant to spell the letters. And it seems to do it, I guess. 171. One zero zero. This is only one gun, but maybe it's easier to see what, what's going on. One four one one, and we go P. Now this is I see. plus, mm -hmm, and it's adding A plus B. Right. Uh huh. It's a faint leak, or the, one of the bits is, is somehow set. Let me try just um, the pattern, just the vertical Y. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, try uh, you want, want to leave it like that? Uh 
Uh huh. Very, very. Do you want me to zoom shot. it out one, one more? Yeah. The back, yeah. the background. Yeah, why don't you extend the background a little bit? Uh, zero five two. Now we're sticking that four zero one. We zoom it out one. Mm -hmm. Do it this way. Mm -hmm. See, it's funny because it has to stay discreet. That means even if it goes through sixteen steps, the switching itself. It's adding though. Uh huh. I mean, every system must have an in interesting feedback because that's the nature of it. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take the output. All we're going to do for feedback is we're going to split the output and feed it back to the input. Now, it depends what we want to do. We can mix. We want the output to feed back to the input. And we should leave the output the same then. Now, we should split the output and feed it back to an input. Okay. So we're taking the output from the ALU, and we're going to feed it back to the first input of the system, which should be the, um, should be what? Huh. Maybe we can um, do it to the memory addressing. Eventually, we have to get some kind of a delay, delay loop. Well, another type of thing is take the output as an XY input. That will be mm -hmm. selected. And splitting the output here. That's now let's run the program. Um, this yeah. is kind of feedback. Mm. Let's run the program. What is this brutal feedback? Hmm, good. Hmm. Hmm. Now it's very fast feedback. It's running on the line. Even looking at the waveform yeah. monitor. So it's a code. clock. It's, it's about the clock clock rate or what? Uh, it's um. What's it running through? It's, oh, excuse me. It's running through four units. It might be 400 nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. And you can see the delay. Let's get to one line. <laughs> How about this? Yes, nice. It's not bad either. And back to that. That's very nice. Very nice. And now, again, we can go through the yellow. How many more tricks do you have up your sleeve? That one? <laughs> yeah. 
look at me Stan. Oh, that's a nice picture. That makes you more pretty than ever. Oh, wow, the blue green eyes. Wow. She's like a queen. Yeah. Da, oh, I da. don't believe this. This is my wife. I don't believe this shit. It looks so much better in green. Blotch. That's fantastic. Wow. Wow. It doesn't look like 16 level though. Who cares? Ah! Ah! Oh, that's the thing. Minus, minus, minus. Minus is 6. Oh. And the focus. Six. This is nice. Look at Zero. this before you change it. XY. EXT. Wow, nice. It's like it has it has that sign it sign you oh, so I think. Wonderful. The, the retina is just going crazy. And I can go back down to H. Eight is this color map. It's red. Num is this color map, which would be the number what? I have twelve, I have eight. I could have four. It's this color map. They're just different color maps that I'm picking out of four. There are four that I can choose from because I have 64, 64 in memory and... You to, you, I understand, we are operating the numeric register. I have the red, I have the bot, the green, the green are the four bits are addressing the memory. Mm -hmm. The top two of the red alu are mm -hmm. addressing the memory also. Four. Logical, six, zero, y, x, two. Yeah. Very good. And let's go to red ah, Wait, hold it, hold it. This is fantastic. And just one, one second. I just want to check one other thing. I'm putting this noise into it. Uh, you noise junkie. This is far out. And you want two, two, two? Uh, yeah. Okay. And How come it's far? How come it's that? I don't know. And take the next one now and make that into. Uh, Maybe it's gray, but it looks as brown. It looks as brown. Maybe if we increase the saturation somewhat. Mem. Three. One instead make it six six six. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's gray. I guess when it's really okay. Okay. Next. So the next oh. That was a totally different picture. Oh my God! This is something. Oh, this is very interesting. Oh no! This is fabulous. Shrink it down a bit. These are interesting. Oh my Let's go back to the one we just had. Why didn't that have anything like that? Six, zero. Must have been something with the display. So this is plus one. Of course, it was nothing. Interesting, huh? Mm-hmm. Very good. So you have a couple of trips left, at least. Yeah, I guess I was going to find them finally. Remember this pattern, the rum, twelve. That one. Zero. You know, the gaudy color one. God, these are bloody <laughs> colors, really heavy oh. shit. Let's go to the old favorite, that's the four. That's yeah, kind of lighter, kind of lightens of it up. That's kind of similar. How come this, I don't see any Y's though? Yeah, there are no Y's. How come? Oh, I don't know. G-R-E, cell. You've got this brain, like. It looks like an egg. Like R2D2. I don't see the Y's. X1, X2. There are some Y's. Oh, you know what it is? The bits aren't all there. Mm -hmm, yeah, I, oh, this is very intriguing. Oh, the, I think I need his hand. Put a hand. Wait, so we're missing bits. We don't have the most significant bits? I tell you because it's pinned probably the way that it, you're missing some. Uh huh, maybe it's pinned wrong. Give me a face. Well, that's the movement up and down, that's interesting, huh? I got a face. It's a bit here. We now have the extra bits coming. This is what we were missing. That's why it was so boring. We're doing A minus. 
B plus one. Now let's look at the, pl okay, that's why we couldn't see it, because the plus one wasn't working. Now let's turn off the plus one. Uh-huh, that was the reason. Red, wow, green, green alu, six comma one, X, Y. Now maybe it'll do something. Now we added one to it, illegal mode. Let's do it again, GRE, alu, A, six, one, yeah, get this down, see what the one does. Mm -hmm. Maybe not much. Maybe not. It should shift the color though when you're moving. It should have already gone to another color when it adds. Oh, that's not a ball. Do we have to have all the bits? No, I want to zoom it the smallest. Zoom zero, zoom one one. Why didn't you do that right away? Okay, stop it. Any, any, anywhere. And zoom. Me? Yeah, zoom it. One zero five two. Look at that head, it looks like a target, you know? <laughs> it's great. It looks familiar. Too familiar. Where are you with? I'm behind. It's funny how uh, Oh, I know what we should do. We should switch the color mapping. So we should switch the numeric register to A. A is 15. Mode 0, 1, 7. 2, 7. 2, 7. Okay. Seven. Let's try this. It should change the color mapping as it works. It is. It's more penetrating. No, it's gonna switch.